We've been looking a fair bit at Paul's words to Timothy. And as was mentioned, we're looking at the church this week and next at least. And this is a good place to begin. 1 Timothy 3, and we'll read from verse 14. I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. We're going to talk about the church now, and next Sunday we'll also talk about the church, and in the evening we'll have, of course, our showing of the essential church. It's really important for you to see that film. If you have lived in Canada or the U.S. or somewhere else in the world where mandates and government overreach has existed, and that probably includes all or most of you at least, then uh, I trust that this is going to be a very helpful Uh, motion picture for you to see. Uh, It was painstakingly crafted, and it has our brothers James Coates and Tim Stevens from Alberta, their stories of what happened to them and their arrests, and it also has, of course, John MacArthur's uh, story of his uh, attempted, of course, persecution that went, went on there, and really there was a measure of persecution. They wanted to arrest him. They wanted to find the church and do all of those things. And what it's going to do for you, though, is not just point to those men who stood strong in their congregations along with them, but it's going to point to the gospel, the importance of the gospel, and it's also going to show you that historically we stand in good, we have ourselves in good standing because the church in the last 2,000 years has frequently been assailed by governing authorities, and it has always had a response that comes from Scripture. So you're going to see a historical perspective. We're not in a unique time, except that, of course, we're getting closer and closer to the end. But we are standing in a long line of Christians who have stood against wickedness in high places. So please make sure you come out to that. Well, today we're looking at the universal or invisible church meaning the church for which Christ died, including all those who have believed in His work and salvation from every nation, tribe, tongue, and people in every century through the ages. It is called the invisible church because only the Lord knows its number. You and I can look around us and we can see those that we know to be brothers and sisters in Christ and we rejoice about that. We can look around and we can see some who we don't know as well and maybe we're not sure of their standing with the Lord or maybe we know that there are some among us who have said to us, I have not yet believed. I've not yet confessed Jesus Christ as my Lord. But the invisible church is not just what we see around us and we don't really know the state of it. The invisible church is the entirety of all those who believe, of all those who who have been saved by Christ. When I speak of the universal church, that's what I'm talking about. We're not looking at Christendom or the Judeo-Christian world, but the actual blood-bought church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so another way that you can look at that is that the local church then is the visible church. It's what you see here. It's what you see when you go to any local church. It's a visible reality. The invisible reality is that eternal standing that we have with our Lord and the worldwide body of believers. Next week, we'll look at the local church to see how we're called by Scripture to participate as brothers and sisters who are co-laboring for the gospel and the glory of God through Christ in this place. In Scripture, as in modern times, we see the church spoken of as a local assembly, and at other times it is spoken of in terms of the glorious institution that our Lord builds. Many Christians confuse the local church for the universal church, and that leads to very bad theological perspectives. For example, you could assume that since you're part of the church, whether you attend a local congregation or not, maybe you don't even need to go to church, and you don't need to worship with the saints. You could just say, 
I can worship at home. What's the difference? On the other hand, you could go to a church that has very poor theology and just assume that the worldwide church believes those same things. You could be ignorant to the main features of the body of Christ. You could be totally unaware of what you are called to be. So distinguishing between the universal or global church and the local church is immensely important. There is much overlap. For example, local churches worship the Lord Jesus Christ and sing praises to Him, and that's true for Christians everywhere. The standards for leadership and membership in the church are to be applied everywhere around the world, and so major portions of the Scripture deal with the entire church, and yet the writers of the New Testament do that typically one church at a time. That one church then becomes representative of the broader church, so there is overlap, but there are distinguishing features of the church. Even in one city, the times a church gathers may be different from one group to the next. They may even employ slightly or very different styles of leadership, though in each case they may be attempting to follow the Scriptures. And of course, some of those may be faithful examples and some of those may be unfaithful examples. Turn with me for a moment to Matthew 16. Keep your place in 1 Timothy 3 there, because we'll come back to it. But we're looking at what the church is. What is the church? In Matthew 16, we find the first reference in the Gospels to the church as an institution that Christ will build. So read with me from verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. That is what we see there. Nothing, not even the gates of Hades, is going to stand against this. Not, not, not even death will stop the church. All four Gospels teach that Jesus is securing a new covenant relationship with Jews and Gentiles who believe in His name. Salvation is accomplished through the blood of His cross. And this new group of born-again believers in Christ are going to form the church. Early in the book of Acts, we learn about the birth of the church at Pentecost. Jews and Gentiles are added to their numbers immediately and by the thousands. And what you see very quickly is that great persecution begins. The church is born. The enemy arises and seeks to destroy whom Christ has loved, whom Christ has died for, whom Christ has been united with. And he fiercely attacks this precious new reality. We then learn of many specific historic churches. The first named church we learn about is in Acts 8, the church at Jerusalem. Now, it's fitting this scripture begins to introduce us to local expressions of the church by naming the Jerusalem church. Because in Acts 1.8, Jesus tells his disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. This is the initial direction of the spread of the gospel. This is how it will radiate outward. This is not a vague generalization. Jesus is saying, you'll begin in Jerusalem and outward from there you will take my word to Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. So in Acts 8, when the Jerusalem church is mentioned, it shows that the church followed this plan. But the church did not follow this plan because the people of God were building the church. No, listen to Acts 1. We're going to see that the Lord was building his church. It says this, after Stephen was stoned, it says, verse 1, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. 
and they were scattered throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria. Amazing. They went from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria, not by choice, but by providence. And if you look at Acts 8.4, it says this, Therefore those had, who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Isn't that amazing? The Lord Jesus said, I will build and establish my church. He said, you're going to start here. You're going to go out from here and in this direction. And that's exactly what we see. He prophesied of the progress of his church outward from Jerusalem. And persecution not only did not hinder the church, but fulfilled the prophetic word of Christ. Beyond the book of Acts, we see not only a temporary scattering of believers proclaiming Christ, but we see countless churches planted and established. These become settled enough to have permanent locations in the residences of church members and beyond. And we quickly learn of the church at Corinth, the churches at Galatia, the church at Ephesus, the church at Philippi, the church at Colossae, at Thessalonica, and all the named churches of Revelation. There are repeated missionary journeys, and the gospel is spread in the first century far and wide. As the gospel spreads to these congregations, we learn that all those who genuinely profess faith in Christ are spoken of as the church, the believers, the saints, the brethren. This is who they are. And so we're looking at what is the church. This is the church. This is an entity that Christ has established and that he has promised to build and that he has been building. He continues to build and will build until it is time for the church to be taken away. In Paul's first letter to Timothy, he stresses the importance of true doctrine over and against the false teachings of those who have been teaching myths and falsehoods, bringing them into the church. He sets forth several specific doctrinal matters, including prayer for leaders and the right conduct of men and women. And critically, in the chapter that we're in here, chapter 3, he sets forth the pattern for the leadership of the church. The leadership of the church. And so at... Verse 14 of chapter 3, he says to Timothy, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself. Effectively, I would tell you these things in person, but the urgency, the importance of this is too great that even if something should happen to me, if I were delayed or worse, you've got to know this, Timothy. You have to know how one ought to conduct himself in this place. I'll tell you now immediately by letter. Your conduct as a leader in the church is immensely important because your pattern will become their pattern. Your leaders will look to you as a model and the congregation will learn in turn to look to each and every one of your fellow leaders and they'll follow them for better or for worse. We have got to get this straight. And here is the reason, it is what we're talking about today, because you are not just part of some social club. You are not just part of some community center. You are part of this at the end of verse 15, and Scripture gives us synonyms here. You are part of the household of God, which is the church of the living God. Now the word household, oikos, on its own is a simple term for a building or a dwelling place. By the way, we have other synonyms elsewhere in Scripture like the body, the bride, the flock, the assembly, etc. But he's emphasizing some important features here. So oikos on its own can be just a simple place or gathering, but connected to a person, it frequently represents an association or a family. So, for example, in Acts 16, when Paul and Silas were imprisoned for the gospel and they were singing songs, hymns to the Lord in their joyfulness that they would be persecuted for the name of Christ, they had not lost hope. You'll remember that there was a great earthquake and the doors of the prison flung open and the jailer was about to fall on his own sword because he felt like he was going to be, of course, executed or something was going to happen to him as often did if a jailer had released prisoners or had not been able to keep them. And Paul, 
the scripture says, cried out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself for we are all here. The jailer then fell down before them and asked this, sirs, what must I be, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household, you and your household. So that's the same word there, household. And in context, you know that he's not talking about a building, but of the family of the jailer. You and your household, if you and they believe, you and they will be saved. And by the way, that's the, the proper interpretation of that verse. It's not if you believe your whole household is saved. It is if you believe you will be saved and your household likewise, if they believe they will be saved. But the point is here, this is a household And the household of God takes on immense significance because we are of this household. We are part of an institution which is itself the household of God. More directly, we are the family of God. John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Romans 8 says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs, listen, with Christ. If you are part of this household, you are fellow heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. If, the text says, at Romans 8, 16 and 17, if we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. We often miss those parts of it. One of the identifying marks of a Christian is that they will suffer for Christ. The household of God is then equated to the church, and just as we are not simply part of some household, but the household of God, so too we are not just part of some church. In the ancient world, there were other institutions known as assemblies or congregations using this same word, ecclesia. But those congregations, those ecclesia, were mere human institutions. Not so this body. Not so is the church, the ecclesia, because it is the ecclesia of the living God. It is the church of the living God. Anything that has God's name associated with it in truth takes on completely different meaning. Anything that is directly related to Christ takes on completely different meaning. You being known as a Christian is not significant because you are a Christian. You being known as a Christian is significant because Christ has purchased you, has saved you, has redeemed you. He is the one that is in focus. The Christian is the one who wants to be known not as a great man or woman, but as a man or woman of a great God. This is what it means to be a Christian. You being known as a Christian is significant because the Lord is yours and you are the Lord's. And that's why you're known by that name if you are indeed His. J.C. Ryle says, The one true church is composed of all believers in the Lord Jesus. It is made up of all God's elect, all converted men and women, all true Christians, in whomsoever we can discern the election of God the Father, the sprinkling of the blood of God the Son, the sanctifying work of God the Spirit, in that person we see a member of Christ's true church. It is a church of which all the members have the same marks. They are all born of the Spirit. They all possess repentance toward God, faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, and holiness of life and conversation. They all hate sin and they all Love Christ, says Ryle. Amen to that statement. So we see these two descriptors of this body of believers, the household of God, the church of the living God. You and I could dwell for hours to talk about what it means to belong to God and to be a part of the household of God, to serve in it, to be served within it, to build it up and to be built up by it. We could talk for hours on what it means that this entity we call the church is the church of the living God. We could talk about that for long hours. And Jesus, we could talk about as the living one. This stands in contrast to every other religion. Church of the living God, the living Christ, the living spirit. 
each of the world's religions and philosophies and ideologies, they serve dead idols, deceased teachers, and decaying ideas. Muhammad is dead. Buddha is dead. Plato is dead. A hundred popes are dead. Joseph Smith is dead. Mary Baker Eddy is dead. Karl Marx is dead. Charles Darwin is dead. They are all dead. But there is a living God and His living Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has risen from the grave. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. He is risen. Household of God. Church of the living God. But the Scripture doesn't end there. It adds one more further descriptor, one more further synonym to express what it's talking about. And dear brothers and sisters, we need to understand this in our day. The church is called here the pillar and support of the truth. The pillar and support of the truth. In our day when every other institution on the planet seems to be actively bolstering lies and deception, the church is needed more than ever because it is the pillar and support of the truth. Once upon a time, Pontius Pilate asked, what is truth? And we have Jesus' words in John 17, 17, praying to the Father in his high priestly prayer. He says, sanctify them in your truth, in the truth. Your word is truth. He's talking about his disciples and he's talking about all those who would ever believe. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Scripture, therefore, is truth. The church is a pillar and support, therefore, of the Word of God. Is that true? It absolutely is true. Now, how has the church been this pillar and support of the truth? The church has preserved the Word of God. The church has translated the Word of God. The church has disseminated the Word of God. The church has proclaimed the Word of God. It has discipled men and women in its truth for 2,000 years. The church has always been a pillar and support of the truth. It always has been. And today is no different. In fact, I think you've really, in 2020, you saw a little bit of a foretaste, I think, of the rapture. Why? Because churches around the world were shut down and the world burned. Cities burned. Riots broke out. All kinds of chaos ensued. You don't think that those things are related? That we shutter the churches and that evil goes on and on further and further and and rises everywhere? Of course they're related. And they'll be related again. But if you're in the true church, you know that you are a preserving agent in the world, being part of the church. For 2,000 years, this church has been a pillar and support for the truth. The church is a place where you go to hear the truth. Go to church to hear the truth. Do not go to the evening news. You're just going to hear more propaganda. And I'm not just talking about commercials which sell you things which have always been propaganda. Now it's no different though, is it? They're peddling something. Every night, every hour, the news is peddling something. They're peddling an agenda. They're peddling an ideology. They're peddling something that very often today is antichrist. So that's not where we go to get our information. But that's always been around. There's always been some level of propaganda. It's just increasing and increasing as the Lord gives people over to their sins. Don't talk to your woke or activist neighbors and friends. Of course, talk to them, give them the gospel, love them, but don't look to them for truth. You're going to find blind guides leading the blind because those who follow such things will themselves not be able to see the truth. Where are you going to go for the truth? You're going to need to go to church. You're going to need to go to talk to a Christian. The church counsels the truth. The church disciplines with the truth. The church corrects and rebukes with the truth. The church uplifts. The church helps to heal with the truth. If the church were to fail, you can rest assured 
the lie that has been believed by too many in the world would increase exponentially. Increase exponentially. But the church cannot fail because Jesus has promised to keep her. The church is the bride of Christ and the good bridegroom cannot allow her any harm. Yes, he will allow her to have trouble. She will be heated, hated, but he will be bringing her through the fire. Even through the hatred of the entire world, he will bring her through that. And so knowing that the church cannot be defeated, it is a pillar and support in a permanent, unassailable sense. Why do we ever act like it isn't? Why do we ever act like the church is not holding something incredibly precious? I think every now and again I hear stories where somebody maybe was not really ready to bring somebody to church because they were kind of embarrassed maybe about what somebody would find there or would people welcome them properly or maybe the carpets were the wrong color or something like that. And they miss the whole point because it's not the pillar or the support that we worship. The pillar of the support is just presenting Christ. It's presenting His Word. Bring Him to church and just let the Holy Spirit work through His Word, through the proclamation, the preaching, the singing of the Word of God. No one has ever managed to truly suppress the church or its message. The gospel has never been locked down. In fact, as we learn from missionary biographies in the lives of the persecuted over the past number of centuries, even when proponents of the gospel have been physically locked up, it was impossible to stop their influence. It's almost like the greater the Christian is assailed, the louder is his message. You lock up someone proclaiming the word of God, you may as well give them a megaphone in the community. Because now people are paying attention. They're saying, what is this thing that they hold? Friends, it's the truth. We're just supports for it. We're just a part of, really, the support for it. But the jewel is the gospel. It's Christ. The Lord designed the church to be that way. When it is afflicted, it spills out the glory of Christ. You know, you always can tell what's inside somebody by how they're battered, how the winds of their circumstances, the waves of their circumstances roll over them. You can always tell what's inside. It's like a a cup when it's knocked, and whatever fluid is in there is going to come out. Whether it's water or juice or something else, you're going to see it. The same is true with the Christian. When the Christian, the true believer, is knocked, they're going to worship Christ. They're going to be able to say, They can still say ouch, by the way, but they will declare that God is good to them. They're like other humans, but they have known a Savior that those other people have not known. They have known a sweetness in the gospel. They have known, because they're such sinners and they're aware of it, what He has saved them from. Don't fight the truth, and don't even think that others can destroy the truth. Live your life knowing that the truth will continue, that the church will continue, that Christ is the head of the church and He is the one who, by His Spirit, disseminates all truth. John MacArthur has often said, time and truth go hand in hand. And I think we see that. We see that all the promises of God come true. You can have difficulties in your life. You can have trials. You can have sickness. You can have people that are slandering you, all of those things, but the truth comes to pass. The truth, the truth will come out. The Christian never ultimately loses because they serve the living God, the God of truth, and He will do what is best for you to bring about your greatest joy, whatever happens. Now, the church is the pillar and support of the truth of all Scripture, but in particular, this passage in 1 Timothy 3 focuses on the essential confession of the church concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, speaking of the pillar and support of the truth, the church, the household of the living God, by common confession, verse 16 says, we get into this confession. Common refers not to the fact 
that it is ordinary or mundane, far from it. Common just means that we all share this. We all have this in common. If we are His, if we belong to Christ, we confess this. And it also says it's not only a common yet wonderful confession, But it is a great mystery. Great is the mystery of godliness. The truth the church maintains expressed in the confession of its people is a glorious mystery of godliness. What what did Jesus say? He said, if you love me, you will obey me. You will obey my commandments. He said in the Great Commission to his disciples, teach them everything I have commanded you to observe all of it. And so what we find is that the true confessor of Christ is also one that is truly committed to living for Christ. He lives for Christ, and there's where godliness comes out. He who is revealed in the flesh. Who's that talking about? Who is the Scripture speaking of when it says, the one who is revealed in the flesh? It's Jesus, our Emmanuel, God with us. It is the one who the Father sent into the world. For us, God made man. He was vindicated in the Spirit. Vindication is to judge as righteous or innocent. You'll remember that many times through Christ's life, he was judged falsely as guilty of some sort of crime. But we see a number of stages where the Spirit is involved directly in very wonderful things in the life of Jesus. At the baptism of Jesus, we learn that the Father was well pleased with the Son and the Spirit descended like a dove, Matthew 3, 16. He was affirmed by the Father and commissioned by the Spirit. Early on when He was in the Spirit, He was tempted by the devil, taken into the wilderness. But He was vindicated as He refused to give in to Satan's demands. He would later be blasphemed by the Pharisees who claimed that he cast out demons in the name of the prince of demons. But he was ultimately vindicated in his work by his resurrection. Paul describes the Holy Spirit as the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. Who raised Jesus from the dead. That's Romans 8.11. Jesus conquered death and the spirit shows his vindication through the resurrection. Jesus was innocent and God declared him to be so. He was punished like a sinner, but having satisfied the wrath of God, bearing actual sins of the people, yet not being corrupted by them, Jesus dealt a death blow to sin. He had lived a perfect life, but perfectly dealt with our sins and had in all things been obedient to his Father. I've heard men preach on this a number of times, but the, th- the fact that Jesus, when dealing with the leper or dealing with someone unclean, could touch them and make them clean and not himself be stained by any uncleanness shows you Jesus is God. Jesus is the Lord. No corruption of the flesh or of his nature in any way would come upon him, and certainly no corruption by sin. Jesus had lived the perfect life that we could never live. He lived in such a way as to be so holy that he was hated. He was loved by those who were sons of God. He was hated by those who were sons of the devil. And he lived that perfect life up to the end, up to the point where they nailed him to a cross And then he willingly, because of the joy set before him, endured death, even death on a cross. He was seen by angels. Jesus was seen by angels in heaven even before the incarnation. But it was, of course, the witness of of the angels was a marvel. For them to see what Christ would do for you and I was a marvel. They saw who you were. They saw the sinfulness of man. From Adam until the incarnation of Christ, the angels knew the wickedness of man. And they marveled that God would love you. That He would love us. That He would send His Son for such as we are. The angels witnessed those 
things, all that was done. Speaking of the prophets of God, Scripture says in 1 Peter 1, it was revealed to the prophets, to them, that they were not serving themselves but you in these things which have now been announced to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. In other words, they were serving you by the recording of what they had prophesied in the Scriptures, which you have. And it says, this was from those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. The angels were always marveling at what was coming next. They are not omniscient as God is omniscient. So even though they are angels, they're angelic, they are in the elect sense, they are, they are not sinners. Even with those wonderful attributes and qualities, they nevertheless don't know the future. They don't know all that's coming except for what the Lord has revealed to them. They long to look into these things and they marvel at this. Our text further says that he was proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Proclaimed. You'll notice that these things are all past tense. That is not because we don't have a future that we look forward to and that we're just all about the past, all thinking about what has been. Nor is it that Jesus is no longer preached among the nations and believed on in the world because he is, of course. But it is the fully accomplished work of God through Christ that we confess. It is finished. That was his cry. It is finished. It's past tense. John 19.30 We do believe and speak of the glory that awaits us in the future. But the only reason we can have hope is because of what Christ has already done to save us. It's what he has done already in the past to save us. We marvel about that, and so we confess His finished work. He was believed on in the world by the unlikeliest of people at times, by heathens, by Romans, by Jewish outcasts, even by some of the religious elite whom the disciples thought to be beyond the reach of God, too far gone, yet God saved them. And he was taken up in glory. That is, that Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the Father and will one day return for us. Why is the church so important today? Because it possesses and is the pillar and support for that saving truth. The church is the pillar and support to proclaim and promote and disseminate through to the nations the truth about Christ. The song facing a task unfinished says, O Father who sustained them, O Spirit who inspired, Savior whose love constrained them to, doil, to, to toil with zeal untired, from cowardice defend us, from lethargy awake, forth on thine errand send us to labor for thy sake, we go to all the world with kingdom hope unfurled. No other power has, no other name has power to save but Jesus Christ our Lord. We confess Him and Him only. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's because of that that we have a future hope. Thomas Watson says this, The body shall rise again. We are not so sure to rise out of our beds as we are to rise out of our graves. That's the confession of the Christian. We know better that we're rising again than that tomorrow we will open our eyes. Amen to that. The church is made up of all those who have been reborn. The church is a gathering of God's people. The church is a forgiven and forgiving people. The church is from every nation, tongue, and tribe. The church is for men and women. The church is for all ages. The church is where Satan is defeated. The church is where the world has no authority. The church is where hope is on perpetual display. The church is where one sorrow finds a hundred comforts. The church is where broken relationships are restored between God and men and between Men and men and women and women and children and fathers and 
all of the wonderful ways that relationships are restored. The church is where those who are orphans find a heavenly father. The church is where dying men find eternal life. The church is the only place where even the bad news leads to the good news. The church is where marriage is recognized before God as good. The church is where death is a doorway to life. The church is where everyone knows they're a sinner, and yet the church is where everyone knows there's a Savior. The church is where everyone fails to live up to God's standard, but knows that Christ has lived up to God's standard, and it is in His blood-soaked rags and garments that we have been covered. We stand in His righteousness. He's done it all. The church becomes to us then a place where former rebels congregate. The church is where babies are viewed as human beings made in the image of God from the point of fertilization. The church is where children are valued not merely as the future of the world, but for what they are, precious in the sight of God. The church is the last place the sinner wants to go for help, but the first place that will reach out and bring him in. The church is shunned by the world, but loved by Christ. Do you need anyone else's love? The church is where even one crying hypocrisy at the church will be shown and then forgiven of his hypocrisy. The church is the only institution whose inhabitants will be present at the marriage supper of the Lamb. The church is where the Word of God is central. The church is indwelt by and led by the Holy Spirit. The church is distinct from Israel, yet engrafted into the people of God. The church is is expressed locally in the fellowship of believers in one place, worshiping the same Lord and Savior, engaged in the same patterns of praise and service as the worldwide family of God in every place. The church is where Jesus Christ is King. The church has Christ as head and therefore has no higher authority. No king, nor emperor, nor prime minister, nor president is able to direct the worship of the church. And friends, no one of them are able to suppress the church in any way. The church is a foretaste of heaven. If you don't like the church, you will not like heaven. You won't like hell either, but it's more suited to some's tastes. And yet, not really. It's an illusion. But you will not like what is coming for the believer. What are we going to do in heaven? Same thing we do every Sunday. We're going to worship the living God through Christ. We're going to sing songs of praise to Him. If you don't like to do that now, you will not desire to do it then. What would you be entering into? What joy would you be entering into? This is our joy. It is our joy to worship Christ. The church is salt, Matthew 5.13. The church is a city on a hill, Matthew 5.14. The church is the light of the world. The church receives sinners even as Christ receives sinners. The church is where believers are sanctified. The church is where the gospel is proclaimed. The church plants other churches and extends its reach around the world. The church sends missionaries to fill pulpits internationally. Do you love the church that Christ loves? Do you love the church? J.C. Ryle says, this is the only church which is certain to endure to the end. Nothing can overthrow or destroy it. Its members may be persecuted, oppressed, imprisoned, beaten, beheaded, burned. But the true church is never altogether extinguished. It rises again from its afflictions. It lives on through fire and water. The Herods, the Neros, the Bloody Marys have labored in vain to put down this church. They slay their thousands and then pass away to the, go to their own place. The true church outlives them all and sees them buried each in its turn. It is an anvil that has broken many a hammer in this world and will break many a hammer still. It is a bush which often burning yet is not consumed. That is the church of the living God. That is the household of God. That is the pillar and support of the truth. Father, we thank you for revealing to us the wonder and the mystery of godliness revealed in the church. What a hope we have because of what you have done. We confess that we have seen from your word the work of Christ. We have seen that it is sufficient for all our sins 
to obliterate them, to completely eliminate all that we have done and to clothe us in the righteousness of the Savior. Father, help us as we continue to study the church to reflect on what it means that we are part of a local church, part of this universal church, and we desire as brothers and sisters in Christ to labor alongside one another for the glory of your name. How do we do that, Lord? Show us. Show us in your word. Teach us day by day, even as we're all going about our daily duties. God, would you bring to mind these scriptures? Would you, as we're working out the details and meditating on your word, would we realize and think about ways we can contribute to the church with our gifts and with our skills and with our prayers? May we be those who are present, Lord, for the needs of others. May we serve one another in such a way that we truly shine as a bright light on a hill, a city on a hill, that we would be salt and light even in our direct neighborhood, even in our city, even in our region. And God, may we be just fired up with the truth of your gospel. May we be unable to hold back the joy, and may we be fully able to defend it, to give a hope to others, Lord, to the hope that they are lacking because they have not yet believed, you have not yet revealed yourself to them through your word. We want to be those, Lord, who are used by you, used by your spirit to bring dead men to life to see others transformed, men and women who have lived lives of sin as we all had and yet have known the Savior and have known the change that comes. And as a church, Lord, we understand we remain sinners yet justified. And so we need your help day by day and hour by hour. We need to be sanctified, and I pray that you would continue to do that work among us. May we, even as we think about these truths, be Christians who desire not to be hypocrites, not to be those who live one way proclaiming these glorious truths, but Lord, use these glorious truths to change us. Wound us, Lord, where we are prideful. Humble us as you would, but may the result of that work be the glorifying of our Savior and the salvation of many people. We want to pray, Lord, even for those works that are going on around Canada. There are many churches that are being planted. We're even part of a plant on the island now that we're very concerned to see uh, planted and established well. God, that's a work that you have to do. We come al alongside you, but we want to see that take place in such a way, Lord, that even on that island, uh, in a place where we know is often very dark, that there would be a glorious message just sounding forth from multiple pulpits there. And God, as you take us from here now, we pray, Lord, that you would bless our day. We have been so blessed by you, Lord, all the days of our lives. In Christ's name we pray, amen.